যারে তুমি নিচে ফেলো সে তোমারে বাঁধিবে যে নিচে পশ্চাতে রেখেচ যারে সে তোমারে পশ্চাতে টানিছে দোজ ইউ ট্রান বন ডু টাই ইউ ডাউন দোজ ইউ লেফট বিহাইন্ড ডু হোল্ড ইউ ব্যাক ইন বেঙ্গল ওয়ের আই এম ফ্রম দের ইজ এ টেগোর ইন ভেরিটি ফর অলমোস্ট এভরি হিউম্যান কন্ডিশন হ্যাপিনেস ডিসপেয়ার লাভ ডেথ ওয়ার অ্যান্ড পিস অ্যান্ড নাও উই রিয়েলাইজ ইট ইন ইকোয়ালিটি রবীন্দ্রনাথ ঠাকুর রোথ দিজ লাইন্স ইন নাইনটিন হান্ড্রেড অ্যান্ড ইলেভেন ইন আ পোয়েম কলড অপমানিত মিনিং দ্য হিউমিলিয়েটেড দ্য পোয়েম ওয়াজ রিটেন লং লং বিফোর দ্য ওয়ার্ল্ড রিয়েলাইজ দ্যাট ইনএকুইটি অ্যান্ড এক্সপ্লয়টেশন অ্যাকচুয়ালি ওয়ার্ক অগেনস্ট দি ইন্টারেস্ট অফ দোজ অ্যাট দ্য টপ অফ দ্য পলিটিক্যাল সোশ্যাল অ্যান্ড ইকোনমিক পিরামিডস Did you know the world's 1% enjoys 45% of global wealth? This inequality wasn't even documented properly until recently. But I'll talk about that a little later. Let's take a look at this. In January 2020, just before the coronavirus pandemic broke out, there was an independent study carried out by Oxfam International. This study tells us that in just one country, India, considered one of the world's economic powerhouses, The richest 1% held four times the wealth of 70% of the population. This meant that the 1% of the people had the luxury to certainly assume that they were insulated comprehensively from all forms of adversity that were known to humankind in the 21st century. After all, didn't they have within easy reach the best of education, healthcare, housing, sanitation that money can buy? Well, they were soon to be proved wrong. Just as Rabindranath had presciently stated 109 years ago, they were being pulled down an abyss they were unaware of. When COVID-19 hit, neither the world's richest nor poorest were safe. The coronavirus outbreak has the entire world fighting against a global pandemic. While America is now planning and bracing for the worst, the virus is not discriminating between the rich and the poor or the famous. Celebrities who make up the iconography of this unequal world have fallen victim and that is just the tip of the iceberg thank you everyone for tuning into my channel age of pandemic i talk of the pandemic age as a new era in human history i say that the pandemic age has replaced the anthropocene era which ended in january 2020 the anthropocene era began roughly 10000 years ago when early man picked up agricultural and basic tool making skills and settled down to sedentary lives gradually man thought he became the boss of the global ecosystem the shaper of not only human history but also the history of the very planet he inhabited why do i say a new age is upon us well we now realize that through our own folly greed and a combination of both we are no longer the boss Unknown microbes viewable only under electron microscopes now dominate us. COVID-19 is only the first. There's bound to be more mutations, more pandemics. I try to present the challenges of this new age in each episode. Each of these challenges is a result of an outstanding wrong from the Anthropocene age. I want to tell you that these wrongs will not be righted in the age of pandemic unless we, the millennials, do something. We must rally for immediate correction through actions of the government and civil society. We're all in this together. So, please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. It would also be great if you could click on the bell icon. The subject of this episode, the third in the Age of Pandemic series, is inequality. Would it surprise you to know that inequality and pandemics have their fates interwoven? The United States of America is one of the world's richest countries today. How is it that America accounts for one quarter of the deaths caused by coronavirus? America's wealth and pomposity should have been enough to insulate Americans from the scourge of COVID-19, right? But that is the fascinating thing about an unequal world. The richest people of America, like all world superpowers in history before it, had successfully cornered the resources of the country. Vast numbers of people were therefore left vulnerable to the rampaging coronavirus. Something similar had happened to the Roman Empire. This article was published by the Smithsonian Institution of the United States in 2017. 
the writer had no inkling that the coronavirus was coming. But he wrote, The highly urbanized, highly interconnected Roman Empire was a boon to its microbial inhabitants. Humble gastroenteric diseases such as shigellosis and paratyphoid fevers spread via contamination of food and water and flourished in densely packed cities. You see, just like our own 21st century, even the age of the Roman Empire was under the spell of some kind of globalization. And globalization even then created conditions for massive income inequalities. But in the end, those inequalities were instrumental in the doom of the Roman Empire. Let me explain. Globalization demands urbanization and the historic experience has been that all cities have a glamorous face and an ugly underbelly. The face is made up of the city's money delete who monopolize sanitation. On the one hand, the toiling masses live in cramped quarters where cleanliness, hygiene and basic healthcare are items of luxury. On the other hand, the rich patricians of the cities use their money and political clout to block concerns about the conditions of their less fortunate townsfolk. And then a pandemic strikes in these breeding grounds of pestilence and illness in which the poor dwell. Now we know that we must wash our hands for at least 20 seconds and stay locked down in our houses. But what about those who don't have that much water? When we talk about social distancing, what about those who live in slums and crowded places? So there we have the conditions for pandemics to spread. You will be surprised at history's ability to repeat itself. No wonder they call history the autobiography of a madman. They built a civilization where global networks, emerging infectious diseases and ecologic instability were decisive forces in the face of human societies. The Romans too thought they had the upper hand over the fickle and furious power of the natural environment. History warns us they were wrong. If you talk of the Roman Empire's 1%, you are a history junkie. If you say that the 21st century's 1% have a role in bringing in the age of the pandemic, you are a socialist. But wait, was the American president Dwight Eisenhower a socialist? Defense spending is a symbol of the inequality establishment and Eisenhower, a war hero, World War II field marshal, was the first to say this in public. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. Six years back, in 2014, the World Social Protection Report was released by the International Labor Organization. The report shows that even the world body, the United Nations, was concerned how wealth and income disparities had caused a dangerous imbalance all over the world. The International Labour Organization is part of the United Nations. It warned that 73% of the world's population lacks adequate social protection. The inequality pandemic interface has many glaring aspects. The insatiable hunger of the world's well-to-do for disproportionate slices of the essentials in life is revealing itself in all the familiar forms. The world's rich and well-off are already cornering the paltry resources in terms of hospital beds, masks and test kits. Then there are reports that some billionaires are actually increasing their wealth during COVID-19. The noted writer and social activist Arundhati Roy has described the coronavirus pandemic as opening up a veritable portal on the indignities heaped on the have-nots by the haves. She writes of supply chains running out, food crops rotting in the fields, every conceivable economic ill exploding on the face of the global community, and simultaneously, Islamophobia, racism, and discrimination against minorities mushroom in all countries. I know, I know, the name Arundhati Roy raises the temperature in some circles, but that is like shooting the messenger for bringing bad news. Who can deny that laborers and workers are hungry? Who can deny that even though the haves and have-nots are catching the virus and dying, the effect on the poor is far greater? Is their suffering not far more acute because it is combined with unemployment, hunger and mental depression? Sometimes 
A survey by the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank has shown that the highest risk of unemployment is faced by people in the lowest paid occupations. For years, the economics establishment proffered various theories to justify the rich-poor gap. One of these was that if you allow the rich to increase their wealth, there will always be a trickle-down effect. This trickle-down theory explained itself in terms of jobs created and opportunities for small businesses to grow as ancillary manufactories or services. The revenue of governments was also expected to rise geometrically. We are told that the end game was to reduce poverty and inequality. The trickle-down theory may have worked in different societies. Well, sort of. For one thing, businesses and factories boomed in places that never saw much economic growth apart from primitive agriculture. But anything that begins with a trickle invariably slows. We can now look at this theory as almost an apology for the structures that created inequality. Even before coronavirus struck, there were clear signs that people were not buying enough. Consumption of goods and services was plunging. The inequality in the once rich countries was a result of their richest 1% relying on the inequality of global wealth. I mentioned this in the beginning. Did you know that until very recently, there wasn't much data on inequality and wealth distribution? As a matter of fact, the first comprehensive map of global inequality regimes, the World Inequality Index Report, was published just two years ago, in 2018. Consider this. How come the banks, the mainstream media, and all those smart people who seem to know everything after they have happened are just starting to pay attention to the cruel reality of inequality? You see, in the past, these people only spoke of macro-level injuries caused to the economy by disasters like the 2008 recession, for instance, while glossing over the inequality question. Talking about an economy without referring to the inequality within it is just an abstraction. The answer may lie in the change times. As Jared Diamond says in his recent book, Upheaval, question, when will the US take its problem seriously? Answer, when the powerful rich Americans begin to feel physically unsafe. Today, inequality economics is making a rally, quite fashioning a storm in the upper circles. How the uh, pandemic is going to affect uh, inequality. Uh, uh, a lot of our poorest students, uh, when they go to uh, schools to get basic skills uh, at the tertiary level, uh, take out student loans. Uh, and uh, we passed a bankruptcy law that I, I think of as absolutely unconscionable. Uh, President Trump uh, can go to bankruptcy court and discharge uh, his debts for his gambling casinos. But if a student borrows money to get ahead, to just, you know, get a decent life, no matter what happens, he cannot discharge that debt. Uh, and if his parents have co-signed that note, uh, his parents cannot discharge the debt. Even if the kid dies uh, from the COVID-19, they cannot discharge that debt. The study of inequality is going to assume immense significance in the age of pandemic. As Thomas Piketty says in his latest book, Capital and Ideology, along with global warming, the rise of inequality is one of the principal challenges confronting the world today. Whereas the 20th century witnessed a historic decline in inequality, its revival since the 1980s has posed a profound challenge to the very idea of progress. What is more, the challenge of inequality is closely related to the climate challenge. Indeed, it is clear that global warming cannot be stopped or at least attenuated without substantial changes in the way people live. Also, in several countries, students demanded an overhaul in how economics was taught. They wanted more emphasis on real-world problems. Professor Raj Chetty of Harvard University has developed a course model focused on the roots and consequences of economic and racial inequality. The course is called Using Big Data to Solve Economic and Social Problems. His approach has begun attracting students and colleagues in economic studies. He uses a huge amount of data to map inequality down to the neighborhood level. It is now possible to show that young men of a particular demographic may have access to less upward mobility than another section, 
that is the privilege section. So if anything, the coronavirus scourge has had the effect of injecting a long overdue line of questioning the way societies and governments work. We don't know if this new momentum is going to be sustained. Already we are seeing financial stimulus plans announced by the governments of free countries, from India to the United States. These seem to discard traditional restrictions which were aimed at protecting the establishment line, restrict deficit financing, control inflation. Now, they say, print money, as much money as possible, else there will be no economy left to protect. Before COVID-19 hit, governments feared accumulating public debt. Money was advanced against collaterals and that engendered more inequality because outside the 1%, there was no collateral to offer. So much has changed in four months. Coronavirus has attacked the old line. With large and booming sectors of the economy devastated, governments are forced to see deficit financing as a lifeline. Helicopter money is the flavour of the season. How do you frame policies in a scenario that calls you to lock down the entire economy? A popular textbook theory is fast gaining traction. Helicopter drop of money. Last week, the UP government announced that it would make online payments to poor and daily wage workers if they lost work because of the global pandemic. President Donald Trump and Treasury Secretary Steven Munchin has also proposed in the US, mailing out checks of up to $1,000 to American adults. But who knows what the end game is? For all we know, all this generosity for the poor may just be an excuse to justify bailouts for the corporates and institutions. In 2008, Barack Obama, then President-elect of the United States, gave away hundreds of billions of dollars in bailout to the banks and brokering houses which caused the recession in the first place. He was justifiably criticized for it. In 2020, there may not really be new economics happening. After giving little amounts to the poor victims of the economic deluge, Big business might be showered unprecedented amounts of money and perhaps even lucrative monopolies. So, watch out for inequality on steroids. Already there are signs that the large multinational tech firms are getting richer. Meanwhile, half the world's working population is going to lose their livelihoods. Yes, the age of pandemic will most certainly see the rich-poor divide get even starker than before. This may be a pessimistic way to end. But how can I honestly say, after seeing the signs already emerging, the ones I've discussed earlier in the video, that governments have learned lessons from past follies? It is up to us millennials, the worst victims, the betrayed generation, to seriously consider the motives of world governments. On that note, I take your leave this week. I will return with more episodes on this burning question in the future. Meanwhile, please follow me on Instagram and Twitter for daily updates. Thank you for watching. See you next week.